throughout the evening. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> Happy fall. It's finally fall. I'm so excited. I'm done with summer. I was done with summer when... I was done with winter, summer, and spring when fall ended last year. We're back. <laughs> fall for Jesus, he never leaves. I like the fall too, just in general. <laughs> all right, mine too. We're all on the same fallish page. And if you don't like fall, get on board. If you guys will turn with me in your Bibles, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. We will be covering verses 11 through 18, the rest of the chapter. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 18. Let's pray. First, are we good, babe? Oh, she's checking. Oh, we'll start praying. Father, we thank you for being our God, and we thank you for being faithful and for being just, for being the holy, everlasting God, the living King of kings and Lord of lords. There's none like you, Lord. You are the Almighty. There's none that can compare. There's none that can even stand next to you. The glory of your, your glory outshines any and everything in its weight, Father. We ask that you would... Uh, Prepare our hearts for you this evening, that as we get into your word, that we would see what it is that you have for us, that we would hear the words that you have for us, that we would receive the message that you have for us, Lord. I ask that you'd remove me out of the way, that you, Lord, would have your way this evening, that your Holy Spirit would do the work that you've sent him to do, my King. Oh, we just thank you so much for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What did you say was my to what? Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18, through the rest of the chapter. As we saw last week, we saw the first beast rise up out of the sea. And we went into the little details of the beast, of the sea, of all the stuff. I felt like last week I was on a little bit of a funky mission. I don't have no idea what it was. I felt like I was going off on all these tangents, but whatever. I don't know. I mean, sometimes when that happens, I just assume God has something for certain people or for all of you. It fit, that's what really matters, but it wasn't all of what was in my notes. So this week, I'm really going to try to stick to the text for the sake of time and because I prefer to stick to the text without trailing too much. That's the whole purpose of exposition. But the Antichrist, we saw him come up out of the sea, and we looked at all the little intricate details of that. We went through certain passages in Isaiah where it talks about the sea as the body of unbelievers as the Gentile nations and how we believe this Antichrist is going to rise up out of the sea one of the things that a lot of religious Christian sects perpetrate on the Antichrist is the idea that he'd be a Jew. And for good reason, because this Antichrist is going to erect himself as somewhat of the Jewish Messiah. Now, what we're going to see today is this religious figure pop up, and his name is the False Prophet. More of a title, but he's called the Second Beast. What's up? Right, but he's called the Second Beast. And... Him being what he is and who he is, he's going to ru rule the world or lead the world in a religious sect that's going to come in to worship the Antichrist. We're going to see today that he's going to work by signs and wonders, by powers and miraculous things and fire falling from the sky. And his words will be persuasive. He's going to have the power to, so to speak, bring to life images. And we're, we'll, we'll see that today. And that gives me reason to believe maybe the Antichrist will come out of the Gentile nations. I don't know. We, we, we speculated last week on certain of those things. But again, we saw him come up out of the sea, and we saw that he resembled the dragon. We looked at chapter 12, and we saw that this dragon, the devil, the way he was imaged in chapter 12 is almost identical how this beast is mentioned in the first half of chapter 13. We saw that he's going to be a political power, that he's going to have these ten horns. We saw that the horns represented strength and authority and power. And, you know, we also saw that in the opening chapters of the book. And that he would have these massive horns and these ten heads and these diadems, these crowns on his head. And he was he's going to be a political power. And that he will receive his power from the dragon. I don't know why I wrote he'll receive his power from the beast. He'll receive his power from the dragon. We're going to see that, or we saw last week, that he mimics the Christ. You guys remember what Jesus did, that phenomenal thing that he did that we celebrate every Sunday, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then again Sunday? Every day we celebrate, he died for our sins. He died for us, and then he resurrected, he came back to life. 
well, the Antichrist doesn't die for anybody's sins, but we saw last week that he mimics the Messiah, the true Messiah, and that he's going to have a fatal blow to his head. And then he's going to miraculously pop back to life. And we see that in doing so, it's a mimic of nothing more than what the Messiah did. He's just a wannabe. But the world is going to be overthrown with impressions. They're going to be so impressed. And wow, look at this guy. He's the answer that we've been looking for. This is the political power that we've been waiting to come and to bring peace and to restore balance. And that's what they think. We saw last week that he's going to erect himself in the temple of God. And he's going to demand worship of himself. Today we're going to see the second beast, this false prophet, he's going to be on that same page, on that same wave that he's going to be pushing people to worship this Antichrist. Again, he is called the false prophet. Unlike the first beast, he doesn't come up out of the sea. It says he comes up out of the earth. Now, why it says that, I'm not sure. I didn't go too deep in it. I read a couple commentaries and didn't really care for what they, for what they said. I felt like they were just trailing on for the sake of pretending like they knew Nothing sufficient, but it says he comes up out of the earth. And that he's going to be pictured as a lamb rather than a dragon, which is going to give the idea of more gentle, a gentler person, less, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, pervasive. When we read this chapter, he's not called the false prophet. We're just going to see him called the beast. He's going to be imaged as a lamb with this tongue of a dragon, and he's going to be this miracle worker but here he's not called the false prophet and because of that there are those who will take this stance that for somehow he's not a religious figure he's not some religious leader that's just something that we kind of munch into the text but if we were to turn and you don't have to go there if you would were to turn to revelation 16 13 the second beast is called the false prophet if we were to look at revelation 19 20 and also 2010 this figure, this second beast, he's called the false prophet. Now that is important for two big reasons. One, we have the political figure rise. That is the Antichrist. He's going to rule the scene politically. And this second beast, this false prophet, is going to be the religious figure behind that political power. Now again, like I said, he's going to perform signs, wonders, and he's going to make the people worship this Antichrist. To those who refuse, we're going to see that he's going to not just call for the death, but he's going to have them killed. It's not enough just to chant death to these disobeyers. They will be killed for not abiding by the worship of this Antichrist. And more so, we're going to see him set up this, what sort of wrote it down, a program. We're going to see him set up this program where we all must receive marks. And we're going to take a look at what those marks could be. We're not told exactly what they are, but we'll see what they could be. And to those who don't receive those marks, they too will be killed. They won't receive food. They won't be able to trade. They won't be able to sell. They'll be able to do nothing. They'll be like, I don't even know how to compare it. There's nothing to really compare it with. They'll be able to do nothing. I guess they'll be like people in COVID that don't want a vaccine. <laughs> yeah, I guess I know. I'll probably get censored for that, but I like that. You know, I didn't go to the state fair this year because I wasn't allowed to because I'm not vaccinated. You know, I probably wouldn't have went anyway, to be honest. But if we're going to see that it's going to be a much more extensive program. It's going to be a world-based program, and it's going to be more than just you can't receive, you can't. It's going to be death to those that don't. So these three characteristics that we're going to see that outline this second beast, his person, his power, and his program. Those are the three main things we're going to see about this man. Now, first, let's get into this person. In verse 11 of chapter 13, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, we've seen this word another throughout the text. Does anybody want to take a gander at what that might be? In the Greek word. It's the Greek word, alas. And we've talked about this word. Alas is a particular word. In the Greek, there's two ways you could say another. One would be alas, and the other would be heteros. Alas means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. i give you an example. Is anybody in here a heterosexual? Yes. I am. Do you guys know what heterosexual means? It means you like the opposite sex. If you're a homosexual, you like the same sex. Hetero is opposite. We, we like, I like women. I'm a heterosexual. Heteros means another of a different kind. When you're a heterosexual, you don't like dudes. You like chicks if you're a dude. 
If you're a girl, you like dudes. You don't like chicks. Alas is something different. Alas means another of the same substance. <laughs> Alas is something of the same substance. We saw that with many of the angels, how the, another of the same kind. Another, Because remember how we saw how there were those Christian sects and there's some of those theologians out there who try to tie Jesus to some of the angels that come on the scene in the previous chapters and how we saw that word alas placed before another angel appeared even though some of the resemblances may resemble Christ some of the images or some of the characteristics of the image we saw that, that it couldn't be Jesus for a number of reasons and one of those main reasons is that Greek word alas it's not it's, it's something of the same kind as previously mentioned it's like the other angel like the other angel like the other angel and this guy is like the other beast so this beast, he's like that other beast. He says again here in verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Kind of like that first beast, we saw that he was untamed. He was vi a vicious animal. Same concept, except this false prophet is not going to be quite as vicious. I take that back. He's going to be just as vicious. He's not going to be quite as forthright about it, though. We all know people like that. There's the person who's just flat out does what they do, say what they're going to say, and we all know who they are. And then there's the person who's the snake, who puts on the front, is really nice, sweet, and then behind your back they jack you. You know, they do you dirty. That's this guy. On the front, he's going to come as this awesome dude. The world is going to worship because of him. The world is going to follow him because of what he does, because of his message, because of the just, look, how could this guy be false? And he's going to lead the people into the Antichrist. This, this, this is the Christ, you guys. Look. Look at him. <gasps> Everything we've been waiting for. This is, the prob this is the problem solver to the world's problems. This is how he's going to show up. We keep reading, and it says, And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Now, if you guys ever, did you first, do you know what a lamb is? A lamb isn't a sheep. I mean, it is a sheep, but it's more. It's like a calf isn't a cow. It's a cow, but it's a particular type of cow. It's a baby cow, and a lamb isn't a full-blown sheep. It's it's an innocent little. Bah, it's a little sheep, you know. And it says it's got two little horns poking out. It's it's not what we would think of as a vicious animal. You ever run from a lamb? I mean, if a little goat keeps headbutting you, it might hurt. I'd kick the goat in the head if it was me. But I've watched those videos of goats there. But I've never been butted by a goat, so I wouldn't know. But I'll let that goat know who's boss. I'd choke it out. But you know, you know. But the point is, it's a little lamb. It's not a threatening animal, and it's got two little horns. Remember, horns signify that power, that that authority, that dominance, that strength. Now, this prophet has a lot of strength. But the what is the word I'm looking for here? The what's presented isn't that he's this powerhouse evil man. The presentation is he's a man of peace. He's a man of God. He's a man of religion. He's a man that we can all get behind. He's a man of peace is what's previewed when he presents himself to the world. He's a great deceiver. He's, a, he's exactly what he's, he is. He's a deceiver because we saw, well, we will see, that he spoke as the dragon. But he's presented as a lamb with two little horns. Unlike the Antichrist, who when he's pictured, he's pictured full of horns, full of power, Antichrist, he's going to be a very persuasive person also. He's going to be easy to follow. He's going to, you know, I hate to say it, but he's going to be kind of like Trump for the conservatives. He's going to be somebody you can get behind. I mean, Trump's not the Antichrist. Don't jump out of your socks. It's not, what I'm saying is how you know, Trump came with that power, he's persuasive, and the Antichrist will be like that. Well, Except, but he, yeah, he will be the devil. Did you guys know Hitler was like that? Hitler was charismatic. He was persuasive. He had an alternative motive, but by the time that motive came to light, he already had full reigning power. He was already running the Reichs, and he was, I mean, it was scary. Obama was like that. I mean, I never liked Obama. I didn't like anything about that. He bugged me, to be honest. I didn't like the dude. But one thing I gave him is, man, he can talk. He stuttered a lot, but he knew he said exactly what he meant. He just didn't do what he said he would do. <laughs> you know, he was just, he's a politician. When he would talk, he would talk in such a way that it made you want to get on board. Like, I, like, I can go with that. I, li I like how you said that. But then you really break down what he's saying and it's garbage. Politicians are like that. That's how the Antichrist is going to be. He's going to be very persuasive. 
He's going to be very, he's going to have people behind him. And this false prophet is going to consummate that power. It's going to just, the people that are kind of digging him, they're going to see this man of God, in quotations, if you're listening, they're going to see this man of God speak of him highly and they're going to just jump on boat. You know, I said, you mentioned Trump because a lot of Christians did that. Pastor mentioned Trump, so everybody just jumped. I voted for Trump because I actually looked into Trump. I liked Trump. I liked that he was a sinner. I liked that he admitted that he wasn't perfect. I liked that he put people that were better than him in certain positions. I didn't get on, Trump, any, on the Trump chain because a pastor said So I got on the Trump chain because I thought he was better than the competitors. But that's the scary thing with religion is a lot of people just follow the leader. Like, well, isn't that a game back in the day, follow the leader? That's called stupid Christianity. And unfortunately, the world religions are much like that. Islam is all about follow the leader. Follow Muhammad. Let's follow whatever Muhammad. Muhammad did it, we're going to do it. And that's what they're still doing. I mean, you could say we do the same, we follow Jesus, but he's God. I mean, who else do you follow but God? We don't follow prophets. We don't follow pastors. We don't follow worship leaders. We follow the Lord and the Lord alone. The Lord is the one who is unable to stumble. He's unable to lie. He... It's perfect in all his ways. He has what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. We follow the Lord. None else. The prophets were never meant to be followed. The prophets simply came and brought the word of God to the people, and they were to follow God by following his word. But this Antichrist is going to get people to follow the leader, so to speak. Again, one of the interesting characteristics about this guy is he's not going to come to be worshipped. But he's going to come to direct worship. When we look at these three beasts, we saw the dragon last week himself. We saw the first beast who resembled the dragon. This second beast who resembles a lamb but speaks like a dragon. They all come from, they're all part of this dragon. It's what's known in the theological circles as the unholy trinity. The devil is the devil. The antichrist is like our, our Messiah but false. And the false prophet is like the Holy Spirit. Did you know what the, do you, does anybody in here know what the job of the Holy Spirit is in the church? I mean, he has several jobs. There's one distinct job that the Bible outlines that the Holy Spirit does. Jesus said it. To he does teach us to discern, but that's not it. He, he does draw us, but that's not it. The Holy Spirit, in the words of Jesus, says, He will come to testify of me. The Holy Spirit, the main thing he does is testify of the Messiah. When he draws us in, it's for the purpose of the testimony of Messiah. When he gives us discernment, it is still in that line of the testimony of the Messiah. Everything he does is in cahoots with Messiah. If cahoots is the right word, but it's more of a negative term. But you get what I'm saying. Everything he does, it's about Jesus. That's why the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit isn't saying... Um, a bad word of God's name, or it's not, it's not something we can do and live. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to die rejecting his ministry. What is to blaspheme the Spirit? To die rejecting Jesus. It's the only unforgivable sin. It's it. If you die rejecting Jesus, then there, there's no forgiveness after that. You've blasphemed the Spirit. You've blasphemed his ministry. You've blasphemed the whole purpose he came. He came to testify of the Messiah. When the church age is over, the, the, this Holy Spirit gets plucked back on up to go back to where he was in glory, and we go with him, the church. Just like the Holy Spirit testifies of Christ, the false prophet testifies of the Antichrist. And both receive their power from the dragon. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't receive his power from the Father, and neither does the Son, because they are all equally God. But again, it's the unholy trinity. It's that same, it's that same mimicking that the devil always does. He's, he's a mimic. That's all he is. He's a mimic. He can't, he's, original, no, he's original in nothing he does. He copies. The Antichrist, death and resurrection, this holy false prophet, it's, it's just a bunch of garbage. That's all he does, though. Now, there are those, and this is something that most of us have learned, and you know, I was taught this when I went to barber school, and most of us are told this in the workplace, and don't talk about two things, religion and politics, right? 
We don't talk about, yeah, I always talk about religion and politics. Why? Because knowing God is a right. It's, it's, it's a human right. It's not even, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? You know those unalienable rights? I guess there's nothing else to say of that. It's, it's a right. We all have a longing and a desire to know the Lord because he said that in the hearts of every man. The proverb of Salas, eternity is set in the hearts of man. There is only one eternal being, that's God. So literally there's a God-shaped hole in all of our hearts. It is innately in us. And then politics, because this is our country and we should have say and we should discuss and discern and we should be on page with what's taking place in our country. I talk about religion and politics, but you'll often hear there is no place for the two or the two do not belong together. We look at church and state, right? And what is the government constantly telling us? Separation of church and state. Se separate the church and state. They look like a bunch of belligerent baboons. <laughs> they don't even know what that means because the separation of church and state has nothing to do with the church separating from the state, has everything to do, when that was written, it was that the state would never be able to interfere in the church. You see, the church isn't part of the state. Or let me rephrase that, the, cha the state isn't a part of the church, but the church is a part of the state. So the state has no place in sticking their finger into the church in any way, shape, or form. Our First Amendment right gives us that ability. They have zero authority in the church doors, period. We are free from them in that sense. Our constitutional rights or that First Amendment, that wasn't set to limit you guys. It was set to limit any possible rising government powers. The Constitution is all about limiting government. They have no right coming into the church, but the church has every single right to go in because we are still American citizens. So when they tell you that there should be a separation of church and state, yeah, get the state out of the church. But we're walking into the state. This is ours. We the people. And so when we hear this separation of church and state, that's just nonsense. Even in our governments today, which I don't like calling them government, let's call them servants, because that's what they are. We're going to call them servants, representatives in our, in our states of representatives what they do is they institute religion and politics too because it's impossible to remove the two. Because in everything humans do, religion is a part of that facet. You can say it's not religion. Let me give you an example. What does the government push today? They, they say they push science, which they really don't. I'm sorry. Like You look at the science they use, and it's not really science. It's like a philosophical science breed. So they'll, they'll bring a scientist to come say something that has nothing to do with science, and it's all about a philosophical stance. But science, that's, that's the new religion. That's the religion of atheism, science. That's their God. It's still a religion. But just because it's not Christian or Hindu or, or Islamic, or, it's still a religion. And their religion is the, the religion of science, the religion of atheism, the religion of humanism. It's, it's all religion. But religion and politics, they've always gone together. They always will. So when they, our kids go to school and they're taught about atheism, that's their religion. And they push their religion on our kids. But we're not allowed to talk about our faith and our religious Scientology, stances. Scientology is different than science. It's not, it's not quite the same. But it's, yeah, it's not the same. But they... It's not the same, yeah. <laughs> but, but science in itself is a religion. I mean, the way they propose it, the way they push it, it is religious. Science in itself isn't religious. Actually, you know, it is. Because science was created by God. So a true scientist is going to be a theist Christian. Because when you really get down to the nugget of what science really is, it was given by God and it all points right back to God. That's why if you actually talk to most real scientists, not the dude who went through a science class in the 11th grade and thinks he's a scientist, I'm talking, you, you talk to like people that work at the labs and that build bombs and work on the atomic level and they do all this crazy stuff, most of them believe in Jesus. And I know because in the barber shops, we used to cut the dudes from the labs always. They were always in our shop. I, I got a cousin that works in the labs. You talk to most of them and most of them aren't just theists, they actually believe in Jesus, they're Christians. And when I've asked many of them, you know, does science help you come to Christ or does it make it harder to come to Christ? They said, no, science makes it easier to come to Christ because you get to the scientific level of everything and you see how complex it is. They'll tell you there is no way that this stuff is by chance. It's way too perfect. The way it's coded, the way it's done. But politics and religion 
have always gone together, they always will go together. And it's no different when we come to the end here with the Antichrist. We're going to have a political ruler and a religious figure right behind him promoting him. And again, the people are, are people. People are stupid. And we, when we get into sensationalism, we'll worship blindly. Not all of us, but m m many people do. And they're going to do that in that day and age. You're going to see what the Antichrist is about. They're going to see what this false prophet is going to say and do. And they're just going to say, we're on board. But we're created to worship. It's innately within us. I wrote this down, so I wanted to say it. So some of the religions that our society and our system worships politically and religiously is, again, American politics it uh, elevates the God of self. You're your own God, your happiness, your, your own destiny you created. And that's, that's basically being your own God. They elevate and worship feelings and expression. That's the, those are the, that's the big stuff right there. It's science, I'm God, and what I feel. That's what the whole LGBTQ movement is about, right? It's about self-expression and feelings. Well, I feel like I'm a girl, so I must be a girl. But there's no science in that. That is completely, you have to throw a science not just out the window, you have to blow it up. Like, there's no science behind that, but it's, it's expression and feelings. That's the religion of our society. And we see that our government, they totally, they're on board with that garbage. Politics and science, politics and religion, I mean, always together. But we see that although he's presented as a lamb, he speaks as a dragon. Again, it says here, And then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. You could say that he's a dragon in sheep's clothing, literally. And that's the idea that's presented here. Is, you know, remember when Jesus said that there will be many who come as wolves in sheep's clothing, and Paul talks about the wolves in sheep's clothing, and the false prophets will arise, and they'll come, and this is the epitome of it all. But it's not a wolf, it's a dragon in sheep's clothing when we get to the epitome of it all. And that's how he comes. Again, it's, the whole point is the deception. He's not coming as a true religious figure. It's all to deceive. We're going to see as we go forward in the text. That's his whole goal, to deceive any and everyone that he can. Deception. The second thing we're going to see about his character, we saw the person, this false prophet, this lamb in dragon's clothing. He's going to be a religious figure. We, you know, I feel like we've pretty well established that we all can agree that he's going to be a religious figure but now we're going to see his power and in verse 12 it says he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence the authority of the first beast that he does so in the presence of the first beast it may indicate that the antichrist is the one who gave him this authority now i'm not a hundred percent sure i kind of read it in several different texts and tried to understand that and I'm not sure exactly what that means so whether he gets his power full on from the dragon or whether the Antichrist gave him this power and it's still by the dragon I'm not 100% sure and I don't know but what I do know is that the false prophet his whole MO is to elevate the first beast to get everybody to worship the first beast to get everybody to look at this first beast again we're going to see here that he makes the world worship the first beast so it says he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed now that he makes them worship i thought that was interesting now is this going to be like an enforced make he's going to you know it's going to be i mean there is to a degree where you know it's going to be worship or die but i wanted to throw this greek word out there for make and it's the Greek word poeo. And it means to lead or to cause. To worship in truth, to worship for real, has to be an act of volition. It has to be... So no, nobody can ever force you to worship against your will. They can kill you. Then they can try to... I guess coerce is the way. They can... I mean, they can threaten you. But you can't be forced. Worship is an act of will. It's not something that can be forced on anybody. Well, they twisted my arm. Well, let them break it then. <laughs> I mean, you, we, are, we have power of will where we can do that. Worship is an act of the will. And volition is one of the key factors in our humanism. 
It is what makes us what we are, this, this ability to reason and to choose and to think things through and to evaluate truth and to deny it. I believe like we're going in math, through Matthew and Sunday mornings and we, are, we just went through the temptation and we looked how the enemy came at Eve and Adam the exact same way that he ended up coming at Christ, using the same tactics. And we saw that he uses these same tactics always. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But we saw that in coming to Eve, that she had to choose. Her volition led her to take a bite of that fruit. Her volition led her to want more. It was a choice. It was an act of her own will. And Christ being tempted, remember I said, you know, why would he be tempted? And it was, in essence, to succeed where Adam failed. We can blame it on Eve, but the truth was it was Adam. Adam let his wife fall where she fell. And in essence, what Jesus did is he succeeded where Adam failed. And by his act of volition, he overcame the beast. But we see that worship is an act of the will. It can only come by volition, but he causes and he leads the people into worship. Now the question is, how? In verse 13, it says he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of all men. We call that today signs and wonders. Does anybody even know where that term comes from in the Bible? And they'll have all signs and wonders and they'll do it. Do you guys know where that comes from? It's not Acts. It's Mark. The end of Mark. It's at Mark 16. Is it first, I want to say it's like verse 15, 16. You know what the craziest thing? In the, and we have whole movements of Christianity that are all about signs and wonders. And you know what the craziest part about that is? Is that's not even in the actual Bible. But no, no, it's in the third Mark. No, it's not. If you guys remember when we went through Mark, when we read Mark and you get to verse 9, it ends. The rest of the text actually isn't in any manuscripts that are in existence. Original manuscripts, they're not there. They were added in later. And it was because the scribes that had this book, this gospel, they felt like it was incomplete. They're like, it just ends with this odd ending. And so they took parts from the other gospels and they took parts from Acts and they kind of just stuffed it. You guys never stuff a turkey? It's kind of what they did. They stuffed the end of Mark to make it fit better with the ending. That's what the whole signs and wonders and you're going to go out and do all these things and that's where it comes from. Now, in some of the other gospels, it does talk about they'll have power and they'll, they'll be baptisms and this stuff. And, but the end of Mark is really where that comes with the whole signs and wonders and they'll follow you everywhere you go and so forth. And That's the main part. Now, it might be in another text somewhere. By all means, if it pops up after service, go ahead and tell me and I'll look at it. I don't really look into it because I just don't care that much. But <laughs> I just don't care that much. But that's, that's, that's typically where it is. It's at the end of Mark. But that's what we call sensationalism. Now, that's a very dangerous word in the Christian circles. Sensationalism is when our sensation... Well, what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm, we're stirred up in worship by... I don't want to say magic tricks, but by hype. Yeah? You ever gone to a music concert in the rap world? There's something called the hype man. Flavor Flav, he was the hype man. He really didn't do much. He just hyped the crowd. He had the mic and he'd get the crowd riled up and stirred up. And when you go into sensationalism churches, they scream and they shout and Jesus and they go crazy again. The signs and wonders and they all will heal somebody. And the healings are always something like they made one foot grow an inch longer than, you know, and now their feet are equal. I saw, I've seen that so many times. I've never seen a blind person see. I've never seen somebody who's paralyzed walk. I've never seen somebody who's deaf here. I've never seen somebody who died come back to life. Now, those things do happen. But in the sensationalism churches, it's a fraud. I'm sorry. Like, if you cast demons out of Christians, that's not even a biblical principle. We've talked about this. Sensationalism. It's exciting, though. It is. And we all like to be stirred up. There's, it's, it's exciting to be excited. It's, it is. But then you get to the heart of what's really going on and it's heartbreaking is what it is. When I end up in churches like this and I've seen them, the worst place I ever saw it was in Jamaica. I was in the midst of all these people that were, I mean, maybe they weren't poor, but they looked poor. I mean, their walls weren't finished. The roof wasn't even properly attached. 
I mean, thank God it's always tropical there because if not, that would have stunk for them. You drive through and people don't have roofs or doors or windows and kids are running around in nothing but shorts, no shoes, and they look dirty. And, and there are really nice parts to Jamaica too. Don't get me wrong. And, you know, I, I, and we're in this church and people are dressed decent. I don't, like I said, don't think it's like the poorest place you've ever seen, but it definitely was not some of these mega churches, I'll tell you that much. And dude got up there, and you can tell that the people that helped plant that church were sensationalists. They were these, I don't know if they're Southern Baptist health, and it's definitely the health and wealth movement. And my heart broke for those. I ended up walking out of the service. I was so mad. They were basically shaming the people for not giving enough money. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I'm, I was just like, dude. Do you not think God is big enough to provide all your needs in Christ Jesus? And if you, these needs aren't being provided for, maybe it's not the will of God what you're doing, man. And they shamed people into giving whatever they had left, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And rebuking people for... It was nuts what I saw up there, but it was that whole health, wealth, whole signs, wonders, whole type the people up and let's fleece the flock in the name of God. The false prophet's going to be the epitome of that. Signs and wonders. A lot of Christians think that signs and wonders are the evidence of the presence of God, right? Because if there's signs and wonders, Jesus must be here. I'm going to give you guys some scripture today. We're going to read it together to let you know that signs and wonders mean jack squat. It means nothing. The devil performs signs and wonders. God's not the only one that can do it. As a matter of fact, Sunday morning, what did Jesus do? He showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of an eye. Just the moment, in, a, in a moment's time, it says. Like that. How he did that? I don't know. Signs and wonders. He has a power that obviously our brain doesn't compute with. He is an angel. He is an angel of God, even though he's fallen. He's an archangel. I mean, he's a powerful dude. He can enter into the presence of God's throne room. I can't do that. I mean, I can do it figuratively, but I can't go to the actual place where God's throne room, at least not now. He could. I can't. The devil can do signs and wonders too. He's actually really good at signs and wonders. Sensationalism. Signs and wonders are not now nor ever have been evidence of God's will or being right with God. What are signs and wonders for? Simple. Biblically, signs and wonders are for one thing and one thing only. Do you guys know what that is? Anybody in here want to take a gander? No. No. Signs and wonders are to get attention. That's it. Whenever God does something, it's to get the attention of the people. And you know what happens once God gets the attention of the people? He gives them his word. Whenever a prophet does signs or wonders... Shortly after comes what God has for them in his word. It's to get their attention away from them being distracted by the things of the world, typically. We're going to go to this. We're going to actually go to several spots, but we're going to go to one in particular. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 13. I love this. I'm actually going to write a book on this chapter. I've already kind of outlined the book in my mind. I just got to sit down and write it. But Deuteronomy chapter 13. We're going to read... I'll stop reading when I'm done. <laughs> but Deuteronomy 13. Listen to what God says about signs and wonders. Listen. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true concerning what he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, excuse me, and let us serve them. So what did this prophet do? He gave a sign or a wonder and it came true. It happened. He did a, we call that today, he did a miracle. But he says, and if in doing so, he says, let's go worship other gods whom you have not known and let's serve them. Verse three, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow Yahweh your God and fear him and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice and serve him and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against Yahweh your God who brought you 
from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which Yahweh your God commanded you to walk. You shall purge the evil from among you. Now, has, have you guys ever been in a church where they really institute the worship of the Holy Spirit? It's all about the Holy Spirit. Did you know that's false worship? The Holy Spirit is God and he's deserving of worship. But here's the thing. It's done the way God prescribes. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come to what? Anybody remember? I said it like 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. To testify Jesus. of him. You know what the Holy Spirit doesn't do? He doesn't testify of himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't say, Look at me! Look at me! Check me out! Holy Spirit moving. No. That's not what he does. He doesn't testify of himself. He doesn't come and put on a show to show how powerful or how great he is. What he does do is he testifies of Jesus. That's it. Yeah, it'll bother, it'll bother me too. <laughs> I'm one of those guys that if I see a picture crooked on the wall, I'll fix it even if it's not at my house. Wait, <laughs> but that's what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't tap dance to get attention for himself. He doesn't even care to be noticed, to be honest. He has one job, one goal, one purpose right now ministry-wise. He does this. Jesus! Jesus! Je Jesus! That's what he does. So when you go into those churches and they tap dance and they put on the show and they scream and they're spitting everywhere and they're doing signs and wonders and the Spirit of and it's all the Spirit of God, Spirit, and they're sweating and, and they're knocking people down and they're making them fall down. And it's all about the Spirit of God. That's called false worship. It's crazy, right? And, and we, we take it as real worship because it's so closely associated with the Scriptures. And they talk about the Scriptures and they use the Scriptures to perpetuate that. Except that's not what the Scriptures teach. We're told nowhere to worship the Spirit of God in that manner at all. Jesus didn't worship the Spirit of God in that manner. The whole purpose was we worship in spirit through Christ to the Father. That's how we worship as Christians. That is biblical worship. So when the false prophets arise and they do signs and wonders because they look like they're from God and really they're teaching us to worship in a way that's displeasing to God, the Bible says, kill them. Now, I, don't, I suggest we don't do that because then we'll get arrested and we know we're in an age of grace, but don't put yourself through that. That is false worship, you guys. The false prophet is going to be the epitome of that. He's going to come doing signs and wonders. He's going to do real signs and wonders, not this fake crap you see in the churches today. I'm sorry, but in America, I've never seen one actual, one actual miracle worker. For real. I've seen a bunch of phonies. And they come and they talk about how they heal. And whenever there's somebody that shows up that's really parallel, they always pick some healthy looking person out the crowd. You, you have a headache, don't you? Well, we can't see a headache. I can see this person's paralyzed legs, though. I can see this person's blind eyes. They've been a part of our community for years. Kill them. Why are you at church? Go to the hospital if you're a real miracle worker. What are you doing here? Go spread the word of God in a third world country. Go to Mexico, bro. Go to Guatemala. Go to Venezuela. Go to Haiti. They could really use you there. You do this for money? Signs and wonders. Sensationalism. But it's exciting, though. I'll be honest. It's exciting. And if you don't know better and you don't know what the Word of God says, it's easy to get raptured up into the excitement of it all. It's just wrong. It's the problem. It's wrong. And the Antichrist will be the epitome of that. I'm all out of breath. Oof, I've got to start exercising. <laughs> but this sensationalism, Deuteronomy 13, don't ever think that because somebody even does a real sign or wonder that they're of God. Because true signs and wonders... What they do is they're done to draw attention to God, and then the Word of God is given in whole. But it's never about the excitement. It's never about the Spirit of God moving. It's, never, it's always about bringing people to Christ or into a right relationship with God. The false prophet is going to sway the masses with signs and wonders, and the people are going to eat it up. How many people do we know today? If God would just, if He would call fire from heaven, I would worship. If God would do something and show me, people are like that. That's how the Jews were. Do you remember? Show us a sign and we'll believe. And Jesus said, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. 
<laughs> as, the son, as Jonah was in the belly of the great sea monster for three days and three nights, so too will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That's it. That's the only sign you get. Now, Jesus did a lot of real signs and wonders. You notice how he never called attention to himself. As a matter of fact, he often told people, shut up. Don't tell people. Be quiet, bro. You're making it hard for me to move. Take the blessing and go. Worship my Father. Signs and wonders. <sighs> Those who use this signs and wonders platform, typically, typically, they take the eyes of the people away from Jesus and put them on themselves. That's, that's typically what it's about. You go to most places where they do this, and it's a, it's, a, it's a me show. And it's all about how powerful I am, how anointed I am. You can be anointed too if you just let me touch you. It's, it becomes about me. The false prophet, he's not going to quite do that though. He's, he's going to point to this false Christ. True signs and wonders take the eyes off of me. And they point straight to the Lord. None else, just him. So it says here, where are we at? And he performs great signs, even so that he makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Now, here we see a copycat again. Do you guys recollect in your minds at any other place in scripture where fire was called down from heaven? Not in Egypt. The children, of what happened? So let me just tell you guys. In 1 Kings, we have a guy by the name of Elijah. And Elijah meets the prophets of Baal, and he meets the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of the Asherah, and he meets them on Mount Carmel. And the Israelis are all there, and you know they're, they've been following under Ahab this false worship system, and Elijah calls them out. Now, we all, always talk about the 450 prophets of Baal, but there's really 850 prophets there, because there's the prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah. And Elijah challenges them all. And he says, you guys are fake, in essence. Actually, we're going to read this, because this is one of those things where we're going to read. It's like 20 verses, but I read fairly fast. So we're going to turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings, if you're in the book of Psalms, keep going left. You'll hit Job, Esther, and it's right before these. You'll hit 2 Chronicles, and it's right in the middle of Chronicles and the Samuels. 1 Kings chapter 18. No, verse 20. We'll do verse 20 through 40. Now, listen to what happens. I want you to see this with yourselves. This is what true signs and wonders are about. It says in verse 20, So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two, uh, between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left of the prophets of Yahweh, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said that this is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself and prepare it first for you. Let me see. And prepare it first for you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and called in the name of Baal from among morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they leapt about to the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is God. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and needs some, someone to wake him. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their own custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Verse 30, then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he re repaired the altar of Yahweh, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of Yahweh had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built the altar in the name of Yahweh and he made a trench 
around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers of water and pour it onto the burnt offering on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Whose word? Yahweh's. At Yahweh's word, at God's word. Answer me, O Yahweh, answer me, that this people may know that you are Yahweh. Why does he want him to do this? So that they would know that God is Yahweh. That's what he's saying right here. Answer me. O Yahweh, answer me that this people may know that you are Yahweh, a God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. So what did the signs and wonders do? They got their attention and drew the hearts of the people back to God. It was all about God. It was a show off of God. And Elijah was nothing but a vessel. That's it. So when signs and wonders are done, it's not done to show how great I am, how great pastor is to show you that God is really God. That's what signs and wonders are about. And it's typically done to people who are being obstinate and rebellious at that moment. It's not done to people who are already believing. Notice where he's at. He's on Mount Carmel trying to win the hearts of the Israel people back to their God. He doesn't go to the Jerusalem, the religious center of the world, and say, hey, all you worshiping Jesus let me, or, or worshiping the living God, well, let me show you signs and wonders so you'll believe in the living God. It's, it's always to people who are not of the faith. Signs and wonders aren't for Christians. I'm sorry. When we do signs and wonders, when they are actually done through Christians, it's to people who don't believe. That's where it's done. You really want to do signs and wonders? Go to Africa, man. I, I promise you this. You go out there and you really go out, out at the word of God, he's going to do things through you that you don't even know were possible. But you're in America where God is preached on every street corner. Signs and wonders aren't really a big thing out here because most people out here know about the Lord. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying... When the Antichrist does these signs and wonders, it's going to be for the same type of purpose. Except not for him. It's going to draw the attention of the people, not to God, but to the Antichrist. Fire came down out of heaven, and he gets the people's attention away. They're drawn away by the sensationalism. He works in power and in signs and wonders. Ooh. In verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform. But he does real signs, so that must mean he's of God. No. He was given these signs to deceive the people, it says. Again, verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So now he sets up this image. In doing so, he seeks to deify the Antichrist, as an image is made of him. Now, I'm going to keep reading because it's important what's said in verse 15. And it was given him to breathe, or it was given him breath to, yeah, it was given him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So he gives power to this beast to, or this image to speak that's made in the image of this first beast in this antichrist in deifying him now when this image comes to life you know i really thought about this and i is a query of mine is this a supernatural act is like a picture or some kind of mold of this guy set up and it just comes to life and or we live in a day and age where artificial technology artificial intelligence is a real thing you go to Disney World and they got, you know, dead presidents who speak and you can go to museums where they have the robotic people and it looks like they're alive. Now, keep in mind, John is seeing this vision. John doesn't know what AI is. He has no clue what AI is. He doesn't even know what electricity is. And so, 
as John has seen this, could this image being set up be nothing more than a, you know, a robot image of this beast speaking these blasphemous things? Or is it just a real image that's set up and the image actually comes to life? John wouldn't be able to distinguish that. He just, he wouldn't. There would be no way for him to distinguish that. He's only writing down what he's seeing. So I, I, I ponder that to you guys. I know, you know, I've always in my mind had this idea of this inanimate object just coming to life and it's like got a real spirit. But there's a very real idea that this image set up is nothing more than some artificial intelligence in a robotic image of this beast speaking these blasphemies. I mean, just wanted to throw that out there, not that it means anything or it's just Hollywood at its best. But if we look at the end of verse 15, for those who don't worship this beast, he says, as many as you do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Consequence for not worshiping this image, for not worshiping the beast is death. Simple, it's death. And in doing that, bless you. So we've seen the person of the false prophet. We have seen the power of the false prophet. And this brings us into the program of the false prophet. This program in verse 16 it says, And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. That's that scary verse. You know, typically when we talk about the book of Revelation, when you talk about it to somebody, there's a few things that come to mind. It's rarely Jesus, it's Antichrist. Oh, the mark of the beast. Oh, the devil, the end of the world. And those things, as we talked about in the opening of this book, they're part of the book of Revelation, but it's not what, they're, it's not what the book's about. The book's about Jesus, but the book does deal with these things that are going to take place. And this program that this false prophet institutes, you know what it actually reminds me of? Socialism <laughs> and communism. You know, every socialist society always turns communist. They're, they're one and the same. Socialism is the first foot and communism is the final step. It's, but, you know, so when people are like, oh, they're not the same. Nah, they, socialism always produces communism, always. Every, throughout history, 100% of the time, socialism and communism work hand in hand. They just, that's what they do. And when we see this system set up, it looks like that communist kind of state. Social statuses are eradicated. Rich, poor, free slave, black, white, get the marker, die. Get the marker, you don't trade. That's socialism, communism. Government state, people are herded like cattle. Communism, that's... Socialism is when, you know, we just make everybody equal, but communism is when the people are herded. This is really just communism at its finest. And that's exactly what he does. Again, in verse 16, and he causes all, the small and great, the rich and poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Verse 17, and he provides that no one will be able to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you get boxed in a corner. Worship the beast or die, receive the mark or die. I pose to you that the mark of the beast and the worship of the beast are one and the same. People often talk about the mark of the beast is here. It's the vaccine. It's the, that's the mark. It's not the mark of the beast. Okay. If you put a chip in your kid, that's not the mark of the beast. I mean, I wouldn't tell you to it. I wouldn't tell you not to. I mean, I thought of throwing a chip in my kid. And just if somebody ever stole him or something, show up at their door and the wrath of God would come down on that house. You know I mean, but I mean, I can understand why somebody would want to do that. Now, I'm not saying I would, but I thought about it. Like, I'd love to know where my kid is at all times. What's up? We do do it to dogs. As a matter of fact, that's, that's a requirement in many dogs in many states now. You have to chip your dogs, your animals, if you want them. If your dog in our state gets picked up, at least in Albuquerque, if they get picked up by the pound, they get chipped automatically. It's what it is. And so chips are an easy way to track and chips are an easy way to buy, sell, and trade. I mean, think of, uh, my phone's on the stand here, but we have this thing called Apple Pay now. You don't even have to swipe a card. You don't even have to insert the chip. You just wave your phone over the little thing and it reads it and pays through your phone. It's, I've, I've never used it because I don't like the idea of my information being on there, but... I mean, it's supposed to be really secure and work well, which is great, but that's the whole idea. 
So it could be a barcode, a chip. I mean, we don't know what this mark is exactly. It doesn't tell us. But it mentions the name of the beast or his number. And, you know, the idea is that it's this program that this false prophet and this Antichrist Institute, this communist state program, that this is the only way you buy, sell, trade. This is the only way. We do it our way. You don't do it at all. You starve to death. We hunt you down and kill you. Chip, barcode, it doesn't tell us. Now, it does say here that you will not be able to buy, sell, or sell except the one who has the mark. Excuse me. Either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, we don't know what that is. And throughout history, a lot of good Christians have tried to identify the number of his name. And they've tried to come out with his name. And if you were to look at the Hebrew alphabet or the Greek alphabet, there is a numerical value added to them. I mean, you can stick a numerical value in our alphabet, 1 through 26. And doing, typically it's through Hebrew or Greek that they'll do this, and they'll take the letters of people's names and the numerical values, and they do their little math, and all of a sudden, six, six, six. But the problem with that is, you can make, if, you can make anybody's name say anything by doing such a thing. I believe Hitler was six, six, six in his name. Like George Bush was six, six, six. Uh, I think Obama, somehow they made his name six, six, six. And, <laughs> we will know when the Antichrist well first of all the church shouldn't be here when the Antichrist comes secondly we're going to know who this guy is and we're actually going to be told here that we should know who he is when he comes because there's going to be some key signs that he portrays how we're going to know who he is I mean big one is he's going to make peace in the Middle East the Jews are going to build their temple we saw in previous texts the temple is up He's going to squash that beef between the Muslims and the Jews, and they're going to make peace on the Temple Mount. We saw that in Ezekiel, remember? We, they're going to they're be able to come together and worship on this Temple Mount. The Jews are going to separate, but the Jews will have their temple, and the Muslims will have their mosques and their Dome of the Rock, and it's going to be willy-nilly for a few years, and then crap's going to hit the fan. We're going we're gonna to be able to identify this guy, or those who are here should be able to identify him by that peace treaty. Mentioned in Daniel, executed in Revelation. But this mark of the beast or the number of his name, we're not told what the mark is, so we can't say. Marco chip, maybe. Maybe they'll come up with some kind of new technology. I don't know. But you won't be able to do anything without it. That we do know. Now the number of his name, we're going to read this last verse. It says, Let, uh, he, uh, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man. And his number is 666. And that's that scary number that we see in movies and it's the devil. And, you know, if you get something that says 666, you'll take a loss on a dollar just so it doesn't say 666. I've done that, you know. <laughs> Here, have a dollar. Why? Because I don't want 666. I'll take $665. You know, I've done that. You know, we've all, because it's just, we see that and we associate with this and nobody want to be associated with that number. You know, if you're in line somewhere, you're number 666, you'll squash that ticket and get a new ticket. You know? <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to be 666. That's just what it is. But it says we should have wisdom and we should calculate the number of his name. Again, like I said, in the Greek and the Hebrew, these numerical values, people have tried to guess who this guy is. And I would tell you, don't. First and foremost, you shouldn't be looking for the Antichrist. Okay? Don't do it. When we put our eyes on Jesus the Christ, then why does it say here that here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate, calculate the number of his name? I believe that is geared towards those in this time period here. Not in our time period now. Those in this time period have understanding and get this right. I mean, like I've said, for those in this time period, they should know who the Antichrist is immediately. Treaties being signed. Israel's at peace in the Middle East. They're building their temple. That's the guy. That's him. That, that, that's him. That's the dude. It's the dude that all them Christians were warning us about. But again, you know, the world isn't a believer at that point. They don't know the Lord, so they're not going to be associating the things. They're just going to be worshiping the dude for all the great that he's doing. And then all the chaos that's happening because of, you know, this tribulation period of God judging the world, the seals and the trumpets, and we're going to see here momentarily the bowls of wrath. This guy's going to be in so-called heaven-sent prayer because he's going to help group the world together. He's going to help everybody have a vision and come together and unify. And 
but it's just going to be false. False peace. Biblically, the number six is the letter for man. And it's an appropriate letter. Again, in the Hebrew and in the biblical sense, numbers have meanings. Three, anybody know what three is the number of? Completion. No. 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 Perfection. Three is the number of perfection. Yeah. You got it right, but then you denounced it. So. <laughs> three is the number of perfection. Yeah. Seven. No. Seven. Three is the number of three is the number of perfection. Seven. Five is the number of grace. grace. Yeah. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. I mean, and you can go on. I don't know every little numerology, or, you know, but I mean, there's, for every number, they have things, and biblically, we see the patterns throughout. And often we see God associated with sevens. Remember in the beginning, seven horns, seven eyes, seven crowns, seven wheels, seven, seven, seven. And because that represents a completeness in it. Not that there's actually seven eyes on God's face and he got the seven horns and all that. It's, it's a completion. He's complete in, in sight and power and wisdom and mind and completion. Well, man is perfect for being number six because man as God's crowning creation, apart from God, falls short of the completion of the number seven. Man is missing something, and that something is God. And man, even in his best, will always fall short of perfection. And when it says here that the number of this beast is six, 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 six hundred and sixty-six, six being the number of a man, three being the number of completion or perfection, you can call him the perfect man in the world's eyes. When this Antichrist comes, as far as world perspective, he's going to be perfect. Everything that the world thinks they need in a leader, everything the world thinks that they need in power, everything the world thinks that they need. But his number still falls short. The six representing man and the three sixes representing perfection. Again, as far as flesh is concerned, it'll be perfect flesh. I believe that's really what's geared towards this in this sense. Now, who knows? Maybe whatever his name is, it'll numerically equal 666 and I'm whatever. But I believe that's what is relaying here in the Bible. But that this perfect flesh, so to speak, falls short of actual completion. He's incomplete. And apart from God, he will always be incomplete. And I believe that's what's being said here. And so today what we saw is we saw this false prophet, this religious figure rise. We saw that he's not some force, but he is a person. And he comes in the name of Antichrist. And he draws the attention of the people by signs and wonders and false power. Real power, but in a sense to bring about false worship. He's going to institute a false program. I don't know the word I can think of. And the world abides or the world dies. And at this time, we're going to see lots of people die. I mean, we won't be here by God's giving grace because we should be raptured at this point. But many will die in this. We've seen a third of the world die, a fourth of the world die in the beginning, and then a third again died later. Many more died when all the demons came out of the abyss and so forth. And we're just going to see it perpetuate further and further. And I'm going to say this in verse 16, we get into the bowls. I've got a couple chapters to go, so probably a couple weeks, maybe months before we get into the bowls. And when the bowls of wrath hit, what's left of the earth is going to be, man, I mean, darn near close to obliterated. But this false prophet, that's who we looked at today. And so next week we get into this switch of the scene and we see the lamb and the 144,000 on Mount Zion and them worshiping this lamb and the real lamb, not the fake lamb, not the wannabe lamb that speaks like a dragon, but the actual lamb, Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you for being God. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to know you. We thank you that you've given us discernment to know your word, Lord, to know the times and the signs of the times. You've given us discernment, Lord, to know what truth is so that we would worship you according to your word, Lord, that we would not be deceived or led astray by lying signs and wonders, Lord but that we would worship you in spirit and truth. I thank you for those who are here this evening and those who are watching online. I thank you that you have given them a heart to want you and to know you and to love you, Lord. I pray that you would just move in each of us, Father. And you would draw us nearer to yourself than we were yesterday. Would you cause your face to shine upon us, Lord? Would you uphold us with your righteous right hand as you lead us through the end of this week? 
We just give all praise, honor, and glory to you, and we thank you so much for loving us and for dying for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.